Newsweek has called Michael Beschloss the nation's leading presidential historian. He's a regular commentator on PBS's The uh, News Hour with Jim Lehrer, a contributor also to ABC Television. We're talking to him in Chicago on the occasion of his being named a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. Michael, congratulations on the honor. Thank you very much, Jack. It's wonderful to sit down and finally have a chance to talk to you. Yeah, same here. Wow. Your interest in the presidency began early in life. What, what are your first memories of the office? Well, really as a small kid, and a lot of it was growing up here in Illinois because in the early 1960s, that was a time when presidents were very important. John Kennedy, even to a child, seemed like the one person keeping the United States from being conquered by the Soviets. And then later on, I can remember when I was about nine, looking at the Chicago Tribune every morning, and it seemed as if there was the same photograph on the front of the paper every morning, which was Lyndon Johnson signing a piece of paper and a lot of white guys in suits behind him. And you know, I thought it was the same picture, and of course, he was assigning a different bill every morning just about, and that was the time of the Great Society, the Voting Rights Act, and so on. So if you were a child growing up at that time, you'd think the presidents were pretty important people. Did you have an early interest in history in general? Very much so, and a lot of that, again, you know, has to do with growing up around here. I went to Springfield and New Salem when I was seven years old and saw the Lincoln sites, and my main memory is that I was taken to Lincoln's home at 8th and Jackson Streets in Springfield, and the guy there showed me the chair that Lincoln sat in, and at the time I had a much more uh, pressing question for the guy, I said, what, what did Lincoln's what did Lincoln do to his children when they were naughty? Did he spank them? And the guy had said, no, Lincoln didn't believe in discipline, just let the kids run wild through the house. And at that moment, Lincoln was the man for me. I, I felt that Lincoln was someone I could understand. And that experience led me to read a lot of books about Lincoln, child's books, and at that point, read more generally about American history and about American presidents. And later on, I found that someone could actually make a living writing these things. Who were your favorite historians? Uh, probably at that point would have been people who wrote children's books, but the first grown-up book I read was a book by Arthur Schlesinger on John Kennedy, A Thousand Days, and that was, uh, I was about 10 years old, I may have been his youngest reader at the time, and I'm afraid I didn't learn too much about arms control, but what struck me was largely the style. I mean, that's a book that begins, it all began in the cold, and then he goes to tell the story of Kennedy's presidency, and about a thousand pages later, he ends the book by saying, it all ended as it began in the cold. And sometimes writing can grab even a young reader, and in this case, uh, gave me a sense that this is something that I'd like to do. I've, I've heard about a story about you writing to President Johnson right after the assassination of JFK, asking that his uh, portrait be placed on Mount Rushmore. That's one, as they say in Texas, that has the added advantage of being true. Uh, I was living down in Flossmore, bottom of Cook County near Park Forest, and was very much affected as a lot of kids and everyone was by John Kennedy's assassination. I was nearly eight, and so wrote a letter to President Johnson suggesting, I think what it says is that LBJ hire a large carving firm to carve Kennedy's head in Mount Rushmore. And, you know, a couple weeks later I got a letter from Johnson's secretary, Juanita Roberts, saying that the president had asked her to thank me for writing, and I remember taking her letter down to the kids at the sk skating rink, and they all said, must be forged, you know, no president secretary would bother writing to an eight-year-old. And finally, years later, I went to the LBJ library in Texas, my first trip, and I said, you know, at that age, I wasn't exactly in the habit of keeping copies of my outgoing letters, but is there any chance, you know, they might have this child's letter that I had sent? and they were so well organized, they were able to pull it out in about five minutes, and there it was. Wow. Tell us about your academic training. Who were your main influences? You, you mentioned Schlesinger a little bit, Schlesinger a bit earlier. Well, one thing that was very helpful, I went to some excellent public schools in Flossmoor until the eighth grade, and then had the opportunity then to go to a boarding school in Massachusetts called Andover. And the headmaster there was a guy named Ted Sizer, who is a very big education theorist. And at that point, I wanted to go to Harvard, which was sort of a fad in those days. And he said, no, if you go to Harvard, you probably sit in the back of a big lecture hall and never meet a full professor because the place is too big. So he had me sent to Williams College in Massachusetts and told me who to study with. And one of the people he named I did get to study with, which was 
James McGregor Burns, the great political scientist, who took me on almost as an apprentice, not in the Donald Trump sense, but in the sense of you know sort of teaching me how to write and research, and uh, to a very great extent made my career possible. I'm going to jump forward a little bit. Your latest work is on the last days of Abraham Lincoln. And growing up in Illinois, where Lincoln is almost a state religion and, and, and an iconic figure, to say the very least, um, how how did you approach the work as uh, by way of framing the issues and looking at Lincoln as at, at this time in life, the Civil War is winding down, the colossal task of binding up the nation's wounds and knitting it back together lies ahead. Well, you know, there's some moments in history that I think everyone is haunted by, even non-Illinoisans, and Lincoln's assassination is perhaps about as high as they get. John Kennedy's assassination is another, and haunted not only by the loss and the tragedy, but maybe the sense that if that president, Kennedy, and of course, you know, much more so Abraham Lincoln had lived, that the whole trajectory of American history might have been different. And so you sort of think, what if it had been the case that Abraham Lincoln rather than Andrew Johnson was the one to preside over Reconstruction, what would that have done about the race issue in this country, the reconciliation between North and South? I think our history would have been very different. So, you know, it's something where there's a big historical impact and also it's an absolutely haunting and fascinating story. There's only so much we can do towards speculation toward that, but how might Reconstruction have been different? Well, I think you can begin by saying that Lincoln had enormous political skills that Andrew Johnson did not have, that this is someone who would have been able to deal with Congress, and also felt that there was a need to finish the work of the Civil War, which was not simply about saving the Union. So I think if you begin to look at it that way, I think it could have been very possible that we would be living in a different country today. The new Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum is coming along in Springfield. It's taking shape under the direction of Richard Norton Smith. This is an institution I think many people will feel is overdue. Yeah, and I should say Richard Norton Smith is a great friend of mine and just an absolutely perfect choice. And you're absolutely right because Illinois has had this wonderful Lincoln collection and it was certainly well housed in the state library, but oftentimes, you know, if it's not combined with a museum, you know, there are people who will just not come to see it. Uh, other presidential libraries from Herbert Hoover all through the present, they all have these great museums that pull people in largely to see the museum and then they begin to get interested in the person himself and they begin in some cases to do research and I'm certain that that will have the same effect here. Why does Lincoln remain such a um, legendary, again almost iconic figure in our history? Well one is that in terms of difficulty probably did the most difficult thing that any president had to do which is to keep the Union together but more than that, I think one reason why he's really lodged <clears throat> almost into our souls is that one of the most basic American ideas is that anyone can not only become president, but it doesn't matter if you went to you know, a wonderful college, as I happen to have the privilege of doing, or came from an elaborate family or wealth. Lincoln had none of those things. He came literally out of the wilderness, had a very tough father, lost his mother at an early age, lost his sister had only about a year and a half of anything that we would call an education, but read his eyes out and had you know, a wonderful sense of character. And the result of this was that not only was he a great president, great military leader, but a philosopher, a writer, a poet, an ethicist in many ways. And here in Illinois, you know, we have an example of someone who you know, really, I think, embodies that oldest American idea. Your first book, Kennedy and Roosevelt, The Uneasy Alliance, started as your senior thesis at uh, Williams College. Now that's one of history's most uh, interesting relationships. The two guys couldn't have been much more different. It is. Uh, in fact, uh, the first time I met Jimmy Carter, he had read my book that I'd written as a senior thesis and when I was about 22. And he said, you know, Kennedy and Roosevelt, they really hated each other, didn't they? And I said, there's a lot of that. And here's a case where John Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy, had been an ambassador who had worked for Franklin Roosevelt and couldn't have been more different. You know, Roosevelt, someone with a great sense of public purpose and vision, and Kennedy, who occasionally rose to the occasion, but was mainly a businessman. Mm -hmm. And sometimes working across purposes with FDR. That's right. And Roosevelt felt that by appointing someone like Kennedy as ambassador to London just before World War II, 
that it would not be dangerous to have someone who was an isolationist and very much against what he stood for. At 22, that's a daunting, uh, a daunting subject to tackle. Well, and I'm afraid the book reads that way, too, like the book of a 22-year-old. Uh, but I was very lucky to be able to get started that early. Coming of age as you did in the Cold War, a number of your books have focused on, on that period in our history. Uh, Eisenhower, Khrushchev, and the U-2 affair, the May Day book. Um, Eisenhower wanted very much to work things out as best he could with Khrushchev and sort of make that the crowning achievement of his, uh, of his president's, his second term. And yet he ordered one more ill-fated U-2 mission before the summitry. It's an example of how history can turn on a dime because if Dwight Eisenhower hadn't, hadn't sent one U-2 spy plane into Russia on May Day 1960, there's a very good chance, certainly not that the Cold War would have ended, but you could have had some kind of understanding between East and West so that the crises of the 1960s, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which almost cost all of us our lives, might not have happened. And it's a big reminder, you know, we oftentimes look back in history and thinks that, think that things were inevitable. And when you think about events like this, you realize how flukish sometimes history can be. No doubt. And of course, this sets, this sets the scene. Kennedy comes on the scene. Uh, the Bay of Pigs uh, operation has taken on a life of its own. And for one reason or another, he let it proceed. What kind of a relationship did Kennedy eventually uh, come to achieve with Khrushchev? Two men from vastly different backgrounds. Very different, but two men who shared one thing which proved to be important, which was they understood how much in history there is accident that can cause catastrophe. They didn't understand each other. One of these misunderstandings led to Nikita Khrushchev sticking missiles in Cuba, thinking that Kennedy would not mind. Kennedy responded by taking the human race to the brink of you know, near Third World War that could have been nuclear war. After that experience, after they solved it, both Kennedy and Khrushchev said, quite rightly, the lesson we have to take away from this is that a misunderstanding like this, next time it may spiral out of control, we can't let this happen again. In Taking Charge, your uh, trilogy on Lyndon Baines Johnson, uh, you, had a, you had something that not very many historians have ever had access to, a wonderful library of uh, tapes that, in which Johnson taped almost all of his telephone calls and you get a much different kind of portrait of the man than the somewhat, the somewhat wooden appearance of Johnson on television. Well, it lets you get into the background. You know, what, for instance, if we had had tapes of Abraham Lincoln on the day that he made decisions about Fort Sumter or Franklin Roosevelt on the day of Pearl Harbor, we amazingly had those with Johnson and, you know, for an historian to have a cache like this suddenly open, you know, it's a, it's a treasure trove for us of the kind that usually we don't find because papers are usually open slowly. And the other thing is that, you know, you listen to Johnson in private, you not only now know what he said, but you hear the voice and the emotion in it, the noises in the background, they really do take you into the historical moment. One of the, ver well, I guess the very first recording is taken uh, from the radio transcripts or radio transmissions off of Air Force One getting ready to go back on that terrible flight from Dallas to Washington. Take us inside that for a moment. Well, Johnson was on Air Force One, had just been sworn in, was flying back to Washington, and I was the first one, I think, to hear this tape in 35 years, and they put it on the machine. We didn't know what we'd be hearing, and you hear aircraft engines screaming and people crying in the background, and Johnson calls Rose Kennedy, John Kennedy's mother, and one of these you know, details that really you know, take you into that moment He's asked for Mrs. Kennedy, and the operator is about to say to Mrs. Kennedy, President Johnson is for you on the line. The operator knows that that's just going to devastate her, so the operator catches himself and says, we have Mr. Johnson for you on the line. And then Johnson says, Mrs. Kennedy, we're grieving with you. And Lady Bird, his wife, says, country was lucky to have your son as long as it did. At that point, Rose Kennedy is just overcome and has to get off, understandably. But for all of us who weren't on that plane and for those people who weren't alive in 1963 gives you an unparalleled idea of what it must have been to be a new president just after John Kennedy's death. And this was a president who, from the very beginning, I think most of contemporary hist historians have thought that Johnson was wedded to the idea of finishing the Vietnam conflict. But through your going back through the tapes and the transcripts, 
a very different picture emerges of someone who wasn't completely sold on the thing. Yeah, you know, Johnson is saying to his foreign policy aides, what do I care about Vietnam? Most American people don't know where the place is. You know, why is it necessary to do this? Mm -hmm. And he really agonizes as the time goes on, and he's committing more and more troops to Vietnam, and knowing in the end it's going to be a losing proposition. That's the downside. The downside is in 1965, I found that at the same time as he was beginning to send Americans in big numbers to Vietnam and saying, go, you know, nail the coon skin to the wall and let's have a victory, in private he is saying such things as, I can't think of anything worse than losing this war and I don't see any way that we can win. And that, I think, leads to a very harsh judgment about Lyndon Johnson. This is someone who, as he thought of himself, would have liked to have been remembered as a figure like FDR, like or Lincoln-esque, in fact. Hope to and expected to, especially with what he did for civil rights and against poverty and for education. But, as I found, as early as the summer of 1965, privately, he was so convinced that the Vietnam War was a loser that, for instance, and I wrote about this, I was able to get into Lady Bird Johnson's diary. He tells her in the spring of summer of 1965, on Vietnam, I feel as if I'm in a plane that's crashing and I do not have a parachute. This is the same president, as you said, who, who won some crucial victories like the Voting, right, Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. Um, knowing what you know now about Lyndon Johnson from all you've gathered from the conversations and the historical record and talking to people about him, if you had a chance to tell him, give him some advice, advice about Vietnam, what would you tell him? I would say trust your instincts. Don't be so impressed by a lot of Kennedy's foreign policy people whom you inherited saying, President Kennedy wanted you to, wanted to get into this war, you should too. Instead, trust your political instincts. His political instincts were great because on the same tapes he's saying in private, the Senate is not going to support this war for very long if we're not winning. The campuses will go up in flame. The American people will turn against it. He was saying this in 1965. He knew exactly what was going to happen, yet he didn't have someone say, listen to what you're saying. There's no reason for you to fight a war if what you're predicting is going to happen will. Mm -hmm. with, with Johnson and the Civil Rights Act, uh, how was he able to call upon all of his years of savvy being the Senate Majority Leader and all to push that through at a time when the nation might not have been ready for it? Was it, uh, was it partly the Kennedy legacy since it had begun under Kennedy? Or how, how he began. The Civil Rights Bill in 64 had been Kennedy's bill, so he said, pass this as a memorial to John Kennedy, which happened. By 65, voting rights, which was really more important because it wasn't just integrating restaurants, but getting African Americans to vote, that he felt was more important. And that he had to use some other things, uh, which were tools that he had learned when he was a majority leader. One story is a terrible story, but you know he used some ugly means for good ends. There was once a case, I think this was actually during the Civil Rights Bill passage, where there was a white Southern senator who was denouncing the bill. Johnson, as the leader of the Senate, had known that the man had a woman friend who was black, got the woman to call the senator off the floor and tell him to stop it, which he did. Wow. Other examples of, I wouldn't call it arm twisting necessarily, but uh, using the culture of, the, of Capitol Hill to, and his, his personal skills to advance an agenda? Best of all I remember is Everett Dirksen, who of course was senator from Illinois when I was a child, Republican leader, minority leader, who I remember watching on television. My brother and I thought he sounded like Mr. Ed, and you listen to the tapes, he sounds exactly like Mr. Ed, and a very great man. And Johnson called him up and essentially said, Ev, I know you might have some doubts about the civil rights bill, especially in southern Illinois, it might cause you some problems. People are worried about civil rights, but if you are for it, it'll pass. And that way, a hundred years from now, the school children of America will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. And as the story is told, Dirksen liked what he heard, and that wasn't the only reason he supported the bill, but he did, and was crucial to its passage. In talking with people from uh, Dirksen's era, for example, like Bob Michael, the former, former minority house leader uh, from Pekin in Peoria, Illinois, uh, he remembers going into Dirksen's office after the end of business and having a drink with the guys and of uh, both parties. And there was a sort of collegiality on Capitol Hill there that most people now say is so sadly missing. 
What is the, compare and contrast the two atmospheres from today's Capitol Hill and then? Bob Michael may have been the last leader of Congress who came out of that old culture. He's a very fine man and can talk eloquently about this. That was a time where if you were a member of Congress, and especially a leader, you weren't expected to be raising money all the time and being on TV and running back to your state or you know, campaigning for other candidates. When you didn't have to do all those things, you got to know the people, especially across the aisle, very well, so that if you were a Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat calling on an Everett Dirksen, a Republican, to say, let's get together for civil rights, there was a 20 or 30 year history of friendship. Nowadays, a lot of these people don't know one another. And the stakes are so high, and the, and the fundraising can be such an onerous and practically year-round business. Paul Simon, the late Paul Simon, talked about that as being one of the one of the things that really helped him make up his mind not to run again. Is there a better way to do this? Sure there is. Uh, one of them is to have much more draconian uh, campaign financing laws so that a presidential candidate, for instance, does not have to raise something like $100 million even before New Year's of the year that he or she is going to run. And I think another thing is, at least on the presidential level, is to have a much longer nominating process. The one in 2004 took about three weeks to the time that John Kerry had locked it up. And this is no comment about John Kerry pro or con, but I think it would have been a better system if you would have had six months so that candidates could come in and out and the voters would have more of a chance to know them. And when that happens, I think the candidates are better too because they've been much th more through fire. But a lot of your party leaders will say, we'd like to get this over as quickly as possible so we can have more in our war chest to spend in the general election. I rest my case. <laughs> I want to talk to turn to the to the uh, to the issue of presidential character. Um, could it be, as Americans, we're just so obsessed with the question of character that, uh, when it comes to the presidency, not every country in the world with a democratic system or a parliamentary system has this sort of obsession. Sure, and the reason for that is that unlike them, we require that one human being be both our chief of state and chief of government. If you've got a prime minister and a king or a queen, the king or queen can be the one that's, uh, that embodies character and is a model for younger people, and the prime minister is free sometimes to make dirty, polarizing deals. Unfortunately, we re require one person to do both of those things so that if you're a president and people have doubts about your character, you're gonna have less power to do the kind of things in Congress and elsewhere that you should. Could it be also, though, that character is easier to understand than going into all of the hundreds of policy papers and campaign uh, party planks that you, to really seriously analyze their stands on the issues? I think that's part of it, but if you look at elections, I think rarely do people vote for someone who really does not share their views just because they hadn't done the hum homework, at least on the major issues. I think a lot of it is this. You're looking for a president not only to you know, follow your views on certain important issues, but on the things that you're not aware of, you want someone who you feel comfortable with that you know this is someone who basically thinks like me, has my values, so that if it's an issue that I don't understand, I can have confidence that he'll do roughly the right thing. And that's what I think presidential character really is. So in the end, presidential character does really matter. I think it does, and that's one reason why People, for instance, when they're watching debates, you know, part of it is, you know, let's find out where the guy stands on taxes or on foreign policy, but part of it is a comfort factor so that you can know when he's making decisions that you don't hear about or that you don't know that much about, they're decisions that you'd feel comfortable with. I'd like to shift to the craft of, uh, of writing and uh, researching. What's a typical day like for you when you're, when you're working on a book like that? I try uh, to write early in the morning and particularly before noon and do almost nothing else, you know, not talk on telephone or you know, do almost anything else if I can help it because at least that, that way I feel that if I'm distracted later in the day I've earned my keep and you know, I'm just not just a counterfeit person who, who's not uh, gotten some work in under his belt that day. Um, how much, uh, are you finished with Lincoln yet? or is it No, it's going to take a number of years and probably won't publish until around the time of the bicentennial of Lincoln 2009. I'm going to write another shorter book before then. Have there, have there been any revelations that have come to you? Anything new? Lincoln is one of the most written about 
characters in history, if not sure the, is. the one. Uh, have, have, have there been any new revelations or insights that have come to you? In terms of number of books, Lincoln comes in, I think, third after Jesus and Napoleon. Uh, and he may be neck and neck with Napoleon the way things are going. Uh, not revelations in terms of finding out that the CIA was behind the plot or something like that. But every time you study Lincoln and write about Lincoln, believe it or not, even this long afterwards, there are sources that people had not seen before. So I'm working very hard to find and use those. You mentioned a shorter project in the, uh, in the offing. Can you talk Writing about that? Writing a book on uh, turning points in the history of presidents, where presidents made important decisions that required a lot of courage, might have caused their defeat or unpopularity, but in the end were vindicated by history. Mm, say Truman and the Marshall Plan? Be a perfect one. Uh, or Abraham Lincoln deciding to fight a war to save the Union, which his predecessor James Buchanan, of course, put off as much as possible. Let me just ask a question of the crew for a second. How much time? Uh, just under five. Okay. Michael, how does the passage of time tend to give us a more accurate viewpoint on a, on a president's performance? We, we know, for example, that Harry Truman's polling numbers were terrible when he was president. And now, when you look back at it after the space of some 50 years, he's one of the best. Truman is a great example. You really need 20 or 30 years because you get information about these people from their diaries and classified documents that Americans could not have known at the time they were in the White House. Dwight Eisenhower is another example of a president that people admire, I think, a lot more now than they did when he was president. But the other thing is that you've got hindsight because, you know, you think about someone like George W. Bush. Will he be seen as a great president or not? That will depend on how the war in Iraq turns out, how the war against terrorism turns out, some other things, things that we will not know for 10 or 20 or 30 years. That's why you need to wait. Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s, a lot of people were very angry about what he did about the Soviet Union, felt that he was unnecessarily risking a new Cold War. Twenty years later, especially given what we're learning from the former Soviet Union, there's more and more evidence that what Reagan did actually caused us to be able to end the Cold War earlier than we would have and on American terms. What about Nixon? Nixon, I think, may take longer because it's tougher when a president is enmeshed in very bitter politics and uh, it's not as intense as it was when Nixon left office in 1974, but a lot of people who would write about Nixon and think about Nixon you know, were alive at the time of Watergate and in many cases felt very strongly. I think it's going to depend largely on what he did in foreign policy. Uh, an historian like me, you know, I would say that Nixon is going to have a very hard time climbing from the bottom of the ladder because when you commit crimes, it very likely would have sent you to prison that's essentially disqualifying, and no amount of good works can you know, really exculpate him from that. But people may say it was important, for instance, to open the way to China. No doubt. As a presidential historian, you're looking at basically global issues, not to mention the domestic scene. But is there another area of history that fascinates you that you haven't delved into yet? Yeah, well, actually, uh, Writing on Lincoln, bizarrely enough, is going to be a new experience for me because every book I've written so far has been on the 20th century. And in a way, this really goes back to when I was seven because when I went to New Salem and Springfield and got really interested in Lincoln, that was the first time I really thought, well, maybe someday I can write a book. So I went to my publisher in New York and said, can I write this book on Lincoln's last days? I got the idea when I was seven. She said, great idea, one condition. Don't insist on writing on everything you thought of when you were seven, which was a, a promise I was happy to make. So you've basically come full circle. Indeed. What is the most, what's the most fascinating, as we close, what's the most fascinating, rewarding part of your job? I think probably trying to get under the surface and see things in new ways. And that's why writing about a president 30 years later really is satisfying, because usually these presidents look like very different people years later than they did to the people of the time. Michael Beschloss, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Pleasure. Congratulations again, too, on the Lincoln Award. Thank you. Let me sit here for just a moment. Great. Before you stop down, I do want to ask a question. If we've got any, if we still got a little tape left? Yeah, maybe a minute. Okay. Yeah. A quick question. Um, and I hate to surprise you, but uh, Paul Simon, uh, kind of an unusual politician for his day. What kind of legacy does a person like that leave? 
Well, when I was growing up in Cook County, Illinois, Paul Simon was the epitome of good go government and almost noble politics. Uh, as an historian, I'm entirely out of partisan politics now. I'm a registered independent, but when I was about 12, I can remember handing out Paul Simon leaflets when he was running for lieutenant. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Jack, if you can look at his oh, certainly. I don't think you really need me for this, but thank you. Much better, Ben. Okay. Paul Simon is an unusual politician in many respects, and you remember him from a very early age. Give us your thoughts on Paul. Well, I can remember when I was about 12. Uh, I'm out of politics long now. I'm a registered independent as an historian, and I stay out of politics. But when I was 12, I can remember handing out his leaflets when he was running for lieutenant governor in 1968. And even at, at that age, I knew of him as the epitome of good government and even nobility. And in a way, I hope that the Paul Simon approach to public service has not been lost. He is someone that I think the founders would have loved to see in office, a scholar, a journalist, a public servant. You know, he went into public life and then had a life to go back to afterwards and made a contribution. And the best thing of all, I think, is something that I hope is a lesson to people, especially in Washington nowadays, which is he felt very strongly about issues. You had no doubt where he stood, yet he could relate to Republicans and talk to them, talk to people across the aisle without it getting personal. And I think sadly, in many ways, the Washington of nowadays is a Washington that Paul Simon would find very hard to take. Very well put. Thank you. Um, I think that's going to do it for us today. Great. I appreciate Terrific. it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, he has, he's just started something. One of his last works was starting a thing called the Lincoln Scholars Program, getting young people involved and 